very low. Yeah, lively crowd. Hi. Huh? Welcome to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. So thank you for joining us today. I am the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum's Executive Director, Angie Grove. And if you are new to the homestead, welcome. And let me give you a little bit of background. The Ethan Allen Homestead is a special place that is the site of some of the oldest known indigenous farming in the state of Vermont, one of the oldest surviving homes in our state, um, also the site of a dramatic 19th century smuggling shootout, and a working farm until the 1970s. In the present day, there are many partner organizations sharing the homestead, including the Winooski Valley Park District, who owns and caretakes the site, and its hiking trails. The Alno Bairi, who use this site for traditional Abenaki ceremonies and educational workshops. The Burlington Wildways biking trails and many community garden programs, including the New Farm for New Americans, hosted by the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. The Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, which is hosting today's program, works to preserve and educate the public about the history of this site. Part of our preservation and education efforts revolve around a beautifully recreated 18th century herb, produce, and flower garden called Fanny's Garden, which will be the focus of today's program. Today's program is part of the museum's monthly lecture series, usually occurring during the third Sunday of the month and free to the public. We host guest speakers on a variety of topics related to the homestead, early American history, and all of Vermont history. And I would like to take a moment and thank the sponsors of this program, AARP Vermont, Vermont Humanities, and Homelight. I would also like to thank CCTV, who who didn't show up. <laughs> who, usually, who usually graciously records these, and I'm reading off the script, and I probably should have not read that crap. But we still thank them for being one of our partner organizations who helped sponsor these lectures as well. Um, we are recording this program ourselves in the back corner there, and it will be aired um, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel after this event. It usually takes a week or so for that to get posted. If you enjoyed today's program and you would like to get involved more with the Homestead Museum, we would love to have your support. Please consider purchasing a membership at our front desk or on our website. And if you are local, please consider volunteering. We have volunteer projects ranging from scanning documents and vending costumes to doing inventory, cleaning, research, and giving tours to the public. We also have an all-volunteer board of directors who are also looking for new members. So uh, please spread the word and tell others about this special place. And if you have the means, please visit our donation table on the way out the door after today's presentation. Or you can visit our website to make a donation online. And you can also help us sell off the last of our gift shop inventory by visiting the stocking stuffers table on your way out as well. <laughs> So thank you for joining us at our special place and for joining us in preserving it for tomorrow. So now I would like to introduce, um, I would like to give the podium over to one of Ethan Allen Homestead Museum's Board of Directors, who will then be introducing our speaker. So uh, please welcome one of our Board of Directors members, Angela Moody. Angela Claus, just please throw money in inside yeah. the name of the building. So yes, I'm Angela Moody. I'm on the board of directors. Um, I've been on the board since 2017. Thank you to this man right here, Dan O'Neill, who <laughs> got me involved. <laughs> um, but before I introduce Tom, who's our speaker today, um, I want to talk a little bit about Francis Montresor Brush Buchanan Allen Pennyman, lovingly known here as Fanny. Uh, she was the first white matriarch of the Ethan Allen Homestead, and in addition to being a frontier home, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. In addition to being a frontier homesteader, an orphan, a mother, a Yorker, a loyalist, a widow, an acclaimed, educated, and witty beauty, uh -huh. and a wife, Fanny was an avid gardener, and she's Vermont's uh, first known native botanist who collected dried herbs and flowers. Um, she wrote all of that stuff in her own handwriting, she made all the drawings, she did all that stuff, and it's all down at the University of Vermont's Pringle Herbarium. And um, her collection 
has been the inspiration for decades of historic gardening at the homestead, the most recent of which has been directed by Tom. Uh, Tom has researched Fanny's garden, Fanny's collection, and each year he does, he changes the garden up to bring her story more to life. And he has a great team of volunteers. And in addition to serving the volunteer position as our head gardener, he was also a member of our board of directors for a while. And um, he also works as a front desk manager. He's been doing that since 2019. Tom told me today that he's been involved with the homestead since 1911. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to do that today. Uh, and between all of these positions, serving as a volunteer tour guide and the greeter and the volunteer coordinator, Tom has given actually 12 years of service to the Ethan Island homestead. In addition to that time, he has he is a dedicated cat daddy to his two wonderful felines, Buster and Midge. <laughs> and he loves old books and old movies, and we talk forever on old books and old movies. And he enjoys wandering around Vermont, both by car <coughs> and by foot. He's also told me that he was a, a tour guide at, at, uh, in Boston on the uh, Freedom Trail. And, sure. And he talks a lot. We had, he has some great stories about that. So um, actually yeah. ask him because they're great stories. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Tom Sharpley. Thank you. Uh, I have a hand that I have 20 copies of this. So if you're so take one and pass one if you want one. But if you know if you don't want one, don't take one. What is that handout? Uh, Fanny Allen Penniman has uh, plant has 200 species of two, uh, 200 specimens of plants. 90 species, 200 species of plants that Fanny and her daughter Adelia uh, oppressed, mounted on paper and, and, and saved. And they have them at the University of Vermont today. That's Fanny Allen Penman's herbarium. And if you go there, in 2019 I went to the University of Vermont and looked at Fanny's plant specimens. And they had a typewritten list of 60 of the 90 species. And uh, I took a photograph of that, of that list and then uh, retyped the list onto, the, onto my computer and printed that out and started researching and making notes. And so that's what, that's what those 60 plants are in that handout, is the 60 plants that Fanny and her daughter Adelia saved and pressed in circa 1815. All right, and I'm gonna talk about the different plants from Fanny's herbarium on this list that were growing in Fanny's garden today. But first, I'm gonna talk about myself. And this may seem egocentric to you, but really, myself is the only frame of reference I have. And, uh, and I'm pretty interesting. So uh, if I do say so myself, you know, Patrick, uh, uh, Patrick, who's a board member, heard me talking to myself in the garden. He said, Tom, you talk to yourself in the garden all the time. And I said, yeah, and I'm really very interesting. So, so it's pretty rewarding. All right. In 2011, I had recently moved to Vermont, and I looked around for a volunteer opportunity. So I went to the United Way, and they have a big notebook full of volunteer opportunities, and they needed a tour guide at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And I said, well, I've been a tour guide in my past, and that sounds like something I would be interested in. So I came here, and I took three tours with three different tour guides, and they were all really good. I realized, you know, the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, there's not a lot in the way of grandiose exhibits or anything, but the three tour guides, each in their own way, were excellent and personable and interesting. So I realized this is the perfect gig for a tour guide, because they really needed a good tour guide at this museum, to tell Ethan Allen's story, since, you know, it's just one little house and one little big tavern. Uh, you need a good tour guide. So I said, this is for me. And the thing that pleased me the most about taking the tours was when we went into the, the little keeping room, we called, where they have a display about flax. And they said, this is where you read the flax. And I've done crossword puzzles all my life. And a three-letter word for soak flax, I knew that was ret, R-E-T. But I never knew what it meant. I just knew the answer to the crossword puzzle was ret. And I saw them t telling me about soaking the flax. And they showed me some flax. And I thought, this is the most interesting thing I've ever seen. So I became a volunteer here. I came a couple of times a week and guided tours. till. 2016, in 2016, or 2016, the long-term gardeners that we had, 
uh, stopped gardening here, and there was nobody gardening in Fanny's garden all during 2016. And I complained to Phyllis Drury, who was the president of the board of directors at the time. Every time I saw her, which was frequently, because we would work together on Wednesdays, I would say, Phyllis, it's impossible for me to give a house and garden tour if there's nothing growing in the garden but some tansy and some rhubarb. You've got to get somebody in here to, to, to fix up this garden so we can have a house and garden tour at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. So at the end of the season, Phyllis got so sick of hearing that, she said, Tom, in 2017, you're going to run the garden. I'm pointing to the board of directors, and you're going to do the garden with, with my friend Amy, who's also on the board. And I said, okay. I don't know anything about gardening. Well, that's not, no problem. Amy knows all about it. So then Amy got a job in Rhode Island in the spring of 2017, and she was no help at all, so it was all myself. I had to, it was like this big garden. It's this big piece of ground with nothing growing on it because it's the end of April, and it was just a big piece of ground, and I said, what am I going to do with this? I was a little intimidated. All right, I never gardened much at all, and it's certainly never an 18th century garden. Now, with all due respect to our executive director, uh, she kind of gave you a bum steer when, when she said, here at the Ethan Allen Homestead, we have a recreated 18th century garden, like they would have in 18th century Vermont, that Fanny Allen would, would have worked. And uh, boy, we do not have that at all. We've never tried to have that. We never will have that, because we don't even know what that is. How do you recreate an 18th century garden? Uh, it's pretty much impossible. I mean, I read I read books, I took classes at garden supplies, I hired a consultant, and when I realized in the 18th century, the soil was different, the climate was different, the plants were different, the purpose of the garden was different, the size of the garden was different, everything was different. And if I wanted to recreate an 18th century garden, I really wouldn't be able to do that because I don't have any idea what they grew in the 18th century. So. What am I going to do? Uh, well, what did I do? Well, the one thing I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to grow the flax. So I found out about flax, and, I, and I, uh, I got in touch with the two brothers in Pennsylvania who have a farm. And they lived on the farm, they, they, they took over this farm in the 1980s, and they lived like it was the 18th century, and they became the flax experts. They lived like it was the 18th century with no modern conveniences or, or anything for three years, and then they got sick of that, and said, well, this is ridiculous. We, we want to have ice cubes in our drink in the summer, and we want to have electric lights so we can read our book, and then uh, read our books. And, and so the 18th century thing only lasted for three years. But then they became the flax experts, and now they shoot YouTube videos. They're all grown modern. They shoot YouTube videos about growing flax. They wrote the big book of flax. So I got in touch with them, and they sold me some flax. And I planted the flax. So what are we going to put in, uh, in Fanny's garden? What am I going to plant there? Uh, all right. Well, someone suggested you should plant all native plants. All right. So that's a good idea, except, do you think in the 18th century they cared if the plant was a native Vermont plant or if it came over on, you know, the seeds came over on a boat from Europe? They didn't care at all. So I decided native versus non-native, that's not important. So what am I going to grow in this plant? Let me see. Oh, you know they have heirloom seeds. You can get fancy heirloom seeds and heirloom plants that are like the kind of plant, the exact same species of plants that they grew years and years ago, hundreds of years ago. All right, so I've got a very limited amount of time. I've got a very limited amount of money. I've got a very small budget. And I've got to find heirloom seeds. Am I going to go around for every species of plant that I want to grow? Am I going to go around and call up all the different strange nurseries all over the country and try to find heirloom seeds. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm going to go to Gardener Supply and see what, what do you have here. And, you know, the high mowing seeds that come in the green envelope, that's a brand of seeds, and they make them in Vermont, and they're really great because they like the Vermont climate, and things from high mowing are much more likely to survive than anything else. I realized right away, uh, I was a tour guide, a professional tour guide in the Boston area for many years. And my whole frame of reference for in my relationship with the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum and Fanny's Garden has been as a tour guide. So what does a tour guide want if he's taking a, few people, a bunch of people on a garden tour? He wants to have a lot of pretty plants that he can talk about and say something about. He wants them to be healthy and happy. Uh, so I don't know anything about gardening, and I want to do everything I possibly can to make sure that the plants I'm going to grow survive. 
So I'm going to use the high mowing seeds. I'm not going to use some fancy, expensive heirloom seeds that I don't even know where to find them. I'm just going to use regular seeds, and I'm going to use all the modern conveniences. Someone on the board suggested, oh, you should ha have Fanny's garden and use all the gardening techniques that they used in the 18th century. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. They didn't have hoses in the 18th century. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? Spit on, spit on the plants, go down and have a bucket brigade come up, and, if, it, if it's dry retaining. Forget it. So anyway, my goal was to have a garden where a lot of plants grow that I can show the visitors. So what kind of plants? All right. Well, ideally, it should be things that grew in New England in the 18th century. So we're not going to grow tomatoes because they didn't. Grow, they thought tomatoes were poisonous in the 18th century. We're not going to grow potatoes because potatoes didn't really start till the till the Irish invasion and the Irish potatoes. We didn't grow a lot of potatoes in, in the New World. Um, so I tried to find species from the, from the 18th century. Now, if I go to Gardner Supply and buy some echinacea, some coneflower, is it going to be the same coneflower? The coneflower is a native plant of Vermont. Is it going to be the same coneflower that Fanny Allen saw? No, it's not. The, they're going to be, they've all been cultivated to make pretty, to, to make pretty petals on the flowers and like that, but it's the same plant. So okay, we're going to put in some. We're going to put in some echinacea. It's from the 18th century, but it's not going to be exactly like it was when Fanny, because it, it's a it's a modern cultivar. Oh, so now that being now all that being said, we're trying to make it look like an 18th century garden. So I don't don't go out of my way to put in things from the 21st century. For example, we don't want a plastic fence or the mulch you get at the supermarket. That is all you can tell. It's been put in a wood chipper that they didn't have in the 18th century. We don't use mulch like that. We don't have, um, and of course, so like that. I'm trying to do, you know, minimal, minimal, so it looked like it could possibly be in the 18th century. Things like that. All right. So, oh, oh, oh! I'm going to start showing slides. Boy, what's that? Oh, I should have, I should have started with this. These are our volunteers. I get all the glory. I've been running Fanny's Garden for six seasons, and I get all the glory because I'm the gardener here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And I shouldn't get all the glory because I do none of the work. I'm old and fat and tired and have arthritis in my hip, and I make these five people do all the hard work. And I owe everything to them, and I dedicate this, uh, this talk to Shannon and Dylan and Dave and Hannah and Eliza. And, uh, we, and nor shall we forget Leslie Hunt, uh, who was a, a volunteer in the garden for the first three seasons, who has since passed away. Leslie Hunt, uh, I loved her very much, and her uh, taught me everything I know about garden, absolutely everything. And uh, it was with her grandchildren she made the scarecrow, the fanny scarecrow. That is still, I haven't put the fanny scarecrow away yet, and she's still out there, out in the, uh, out in the back. And uh, six, six seasons hanging out, she's fanny's a little more. All right. So, my first season in Fanny's Garden was my best season. That was 2017. And I really was unemployed at the time, frankly. And I had nothing to do all day. I'd never been a gardener before, so I did everything strictly by the book. Plus, the weather was just perfect. The spring was warm and wet. And everything, oh, that's the wrong direction. There we go. Everything worked out beautifully. This is... The garden of 2017. This is the best garden we ever had. We've never had a garden since that was good and that was as good as 2017. Because 2017 was the year I really cared the most. But we can see this is this is July 14th, 2017, and we can see all the things that are coming up. Look at that. All right. I, there's a red pointer. I'm not going to use that. It gives me a headache. This is uh, this is the plants coming. Look at that. The flowers turning into seed. And look, the corn. Oh, look at the corn coming. Up. We did a three sisters garden. Fred Wiseman told me the Abenakis didn't really do the three sisters. That's really an Iroquois thing. And you know, the Abenakis and the Iroquois don't invite them to the same dinner party. Uh, but we did a three sisters garden, which is corn, beans, and squash growing together in the three plants, support and help each other. And that all worked. Look at the corn coming up and the squash coming up. And the beans, you can't hardly see it, but the beans are starting to crawl off the corn stalk. There are more beans back then. Those red flowers are the bee bomb. 
the B bomb every year since then, terrible powdery mildew on the B bomb. For some reason, in 2017, the B bomb was just dry. And these are the these are the zinnias in the cosmos that are coming up. We planted them together. Oh, let me tell you about the zinnias. I stood up in Quaker meeting and said, I have to I have to design the garden at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, and I don't know what I'm going to do. What do you suggest I do? And a Quaker lady, Jean Flo, you know, came and said, Well, I don't know if they have them in the 18th century, but you should plant zinnias in your garden because they will attract pollinators and they will attract people to your garden. And I said, well, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so we planted zinnias in Fanny's garden, even though I since learned zinnias were introduced to the United to, to, to Vermont in the 20th century. So they're not supposed to be in the 18th century garden. But as I like to say, here's a dime, go call somebody who cares. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So that, ooh, what's that stuff? That's the tansy. That's the tansy. Tansy is the only thing. Tansy comes up no matter what you do. You can't kill it. They put that in in the 1980s when the museum first opened. And uh, every year it's just really big, it gets bigger and bigger every year. You can't kill it, it just loves being where it is. Tansy, they used to use it as an insect repellent to keep the flies off the meat. Anyway, so that was 2017. That was a big hit. All right, what's the next slide? What is that? Oh, the flax. 2017 was also the best year for flax. We got the best, best fiber for any year. I've gr uh, we've, grown, we've grown flax five out of the six past seasons. We've, we've, uh, we've grown flax. And 2017 was the best season. You plant the flax in, uh, early in the spring, and it takes three months to mature. In two months after, after germination, you get the blue flowers on the flax. And the flowers close in the afternoon. They only open once, and they only open in the morning. So if you want to see the blue flowers on the flax, you have to be here before noon. And then the blue flax, uh, flowers turn into seed pods. And then we harvest the flax, we wreck the flax, and we uh, break, scotch, and comb the flax, and we get the fiber. Look at that fiber. Oh, it looks like blonde hair. Look at that. How beautiful that is. That looks like Linda Evans on the Big Valley. Remember her? It looks like her hair. Oh, we've never had flax. This, this year the flax was all right. It wasn't, it wasn't tall enough. Uh, but this was the best flax we ever did. This was 2017. Oh, look at that red lettuce. Oh my gosh. Every single year. Dylan and Shannon, you've we've tried lettuce a couple of times. Have we ever gotten any lettuce? No. The animals always eat it. The mustard, because it, the, the mustard. They don't eat the mustard. They like the mustard. They, they leave the mustard alone. But look at that. We got beautiful lettuce in 2017. It's the only time we ever got lettuce. Look at that red lettuce. Look how pretty it is. And it was delicious. It was good in a salad. It was good on a sandwich. And, you know, 2017, everything worked. I had not a single plant that I put in failed in 2017. And uh, so I thought, well, bargain's easy. Look how easy it is. And then little did I know, I would never see lettuce like that. Ever in <laughs> the animals. <laughs> the animals just would eat, just eat it. Learn the lettuce. What is that? Corn. I tr I've given up growing the corn. I cannot grow corn, but in 2017, we actually got corn. Look at the corn. And the corn and the squash. I, I grew a little small kind of corn because I thought if it had a shorter maturity, it would, it, I, would, uh, uh, I would have a better chance for some reason. But look at that corn. Never saw corn like that again. Oh, and the pumpkins. Oh my gosh. We grew pumpkins. And, you know, the pumpkins and the bee bomb get, and the squash in general get the powdery mildew. And for some reason, I got a lot of pumpkins this year. And the powder, and they got powdery mildew toward the end of the season. The, the, the foliage started to get, get the powdery mildew. But with the squash and the powdery mildew, it's like a race. You know, the plant gets older, and the squash or the pumpkins or whatever get bigger and bigger and bigger. But then you get the powdery mildew, and the powdery mildew gets worse and worse and worse, and it goes down the vines and, and kills the vines off, and the pumpkins and the squash stop growing because they can't get nutrition through the vines because the powdery mildew has, has killed all the vines. So whenever I've grown squash, since 2017, it's always been a race between the powdery mildew and the squash, and, and the squash or the pumpkins. And this was the only year where, where the pumpkins won. I think a few years, well, the, your first year, we grew, we grew some, some pumpkins, but it got terrible powdery mildew, and, and they, were, and they, were turned, they didn't turn orange. They, they were mostly green. green yeah. yeah, they were mostly green before the powdery mildew got them. So that's one. 
that's why I decided that cucumbers, if you, I always grow cucumbers because cucumbers are squash, but they have a very short maturity compared to pumpkins, which take, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks to get a pumpkin that big. The cucumber is only that big. So uh, you can always, if you, plant, if you plant cucumber seeds, you can always get cucumbers, no matter what. All right. So then, oh, this stuff, the bee bomb. This breaks my heart. Bee bomb was from the 18th century. They used to make tea out of it because you, you couldn't get tea from England because there was so much tax on it. So you'd make tea out of anything you could get. And you'd make tea out of bee bomb. Bee bomb's a, a member of the Min family. And I like the, the space age the, the, the space age flowers. They look like they're from aliens, don't they? They look like they're from the, those things that walk around in War of the Worlds. The bee bomb. But the bee bomb gets the powdery mildew. It gets powdery mildew terror. And this year, it got the powdery mildew, but it got the beautiful flowers first. I mean, that beautiful flowers and pictures of the bee bomb against the wall of the house and all that. Uh, but in future years, every year, the powdery mildew got worse and worse. Because the bee bombs are perennial. It comes up every year. The, uh, it, got, it just got worse and worse. And eventually, the bee bomb stopped, stopped growing last year. So we put in new bee bomb this year. Because it was, I loved it so much in 2017, I said, we're going to try the bee bomb. And you know what happened this year? The same thing happened with the powdery mildew. Before even the flowers came out, the powdery mildew got on all the leaves. And uh, it didn't spread to anything else. It's just the powdery mildew just loved the bee bomb. So we cut it all back, and the new foliage came up, and the powdery mildew got on that. So we just dug up the bee bomb. We're giving up on bee bomb. No more bee bomb ever again at the email. All right. So. The tea tastes well. You know, it's a modern cultivar. Uh, they made tea out of the bee bomb, and this is a modern cultivar, and we made tea out of it because that's what we do. And it tasted like it tasted like oregano, which oregano is a mint too. So that makes sense. Um, uh, oh, and these are the zinnias and the cosmos growing together. Aren't they pretty? I love the zinnias. I'm all about the flowers, man. Forget the 18th century. I love, I love the zinnias. All right. So, all right, what's that? Oh, 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 here comes the villain of the piece. It's the, it's the black locust trees. Look at that. There's Ethan Allen's house. That tree is a black locust tree. And if you walk from here to Ethan Allen's house, you'll walk down a row of black locust trees. The black locust trees, soon it became obvious to me that the black locust trees were my enemy because they shade Fanny's garden. They get bigger and bigger every year, and Fanny's garden gets shadier and shadier and shadier. All right. And then they get these stinky white flowers, the flowers, I don't like the smell of the flowers, it's sort of a cloying smell, people do like them. The smell of the flowers, but they drop the white petals in Fanny's garden and the white petals get on all, all the plants and leave kind of white stains on the plants, boy, those, those black locust trees. And, worst of all, they're invasive. They send the suckers up out of the ground and they form whole new trees. And, um, we have a whole bunch of them. We think, I think they were planted probably in the early 20th century. All those black locust trees. But their roots go underground and form suckers. And the trees all become like one organ. Like um, aspen and bamboo are like that. The roots join together and they become all one big organism. So all out there, that's one big, big, that's one big black locust tree that you're seeing out there. It's really one organism. And their roots come up. Their roots fix oxygen in the soil, uh, fix nitrogen in the soil, and their roots come up like suckers, all in Fanny's garden. So, as the years go by, in 2018, 2019, 2020, oh, you know, it's, it's looking to me as if we're never going to have the success we had in 2017 in Fanny's garden. Look at all the things. The corn isn't coming up, the animals are eating this. What's happening? Well, one of the things is, Fanny's garden doesn't get full sun. No, no place in Fanny's garden it gets full sun uh, because, of the, because of the black locust trees. So, well, I'll cut down the black locust trees. Then. Well, that's easier said than done. You can't really cut, you can cut them down, but can you uproot them? No, you can't because their roots are all connected to each other. And you cut them down and they're still going to send up suckers for, for all eternity. So, what am I going to do about these black locust trees? Uh, I just don't know. Oh wait, that's the wrong direction. There we go. Oh, there's a close-up of them. Uh, they're pretty. The black locust trees also, when they first come up, when the suckers first come up, they have spines or thorns on them like that. So you say, oh, I'm going to get rid of that and go and 
Cut, put a hole in your finger. All right. Those are the beautiful snowy blossoms of the black locust tree. And now, oh, what is that? Oh, Dylan and Shannon know what that is. No, know what that is. That is, we have next to Fanny's garden, we have a jungle. I call it the jungle, and it's just all kinds of miscellaneous crap comes up. But there were, there were, two, uh, there were two black locust trees in, in the jungle. We cut them down a few years ago, just because of the shade. And we realized it was senseless, because the suckers just keep coming up in the jungle. They're coming up higher and higher. And you just, you have to go in there, that's, a, that's a, just a, a little wheelbarrow full of, full of suckers that you have to cut down. And you just have to, you're going to have to do it again in another month, because they just keep coming up. You can't ever get rid of them. Those black locust trees. Black locust trees. I have some notes here about the black locust trees. I looked, looked up some facts about the black locust trees. Um, oh, you know, I used to say they're invasive, but they're also native. You know, native plants and invasive plants are usually not the same thing. But black locust trees are native to certain parts of the United States. We don't think Vermont. But they are, but they are invasive. They are considered invasive. And, um, uh, and they are, there are plants. The range, the, 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 they don't really know exactly where they're native to. Because now there are black locust trees in all 48 of the lower states. And the bark and woods and leaves are toxic but the flowers can be battered and fried, and the flowers can be made into a sweet jam. It's one of the hardest woods in North America, and it burns very slowly. They used to use, the reason they planted black locusts here, uh, the, the black locusts we see in Vermont were mostly brought over from Europe. And uh, there was good hardwood that they used for shipbuilding and for building cabins and for building fences, uh, and like that. Uh, it's, why they, it's, why they brought the, uh, it's why they brought the black locusts over. Uh, but, as I said, they send up the suckers, they shade Panny's garden, and they fix nitrogen in the soil. So, uh, that makes some, some plants unhappy. So, what am I going to do about the black locust? You know, the black locust tree. This is going to be a digression into, uh, into colonial, colonial American history. The black locust trees in old New England, if you didn't have a gallows and you needed to hang something, the black locust tree was the hanging tree. And in, uh, in Salem, when they had the Salem Witch Craft Hysteria, those 21 witches were executed. And they don't know if they hung them, hung them for a gallows or from a locust tree. And on the 300th anniversary of the Salem Witch Craft Hysteria, in 1992, they created a, uh, a Salem Witch Craft Hysteria, Hysteria Memorial in Salem, and they planted black locust trees to commemorate the fact that uh, the, the, the victims of the Witch Craft Hysteria were hanging from locust trees. And now I'm going to recite. This I was a tour guide in Salem, so now you're going to get, get the Giles Corey poem in its entirety. Uh, Giles Corey was one of the was one of the witches. He was the only one that wasn't hanged during the Salem witch crime trials. He was pressed to death in stones. But there's a ballad of Giles Corey which mentions the locust tree. Giles Corey was a wizard strong, a stubborn wretch was he, and fit was he to hang on high upon the locust tree. So when before the magistrates for trial he did come, he would no true confession make, but was completely dumb. Giles Corey, said the magistrates, what hast thou here to plead to those who now accuse thy soul of crime and hard deed? Giles Corey, he said not a word, no single word spoke he. Giles Corey, said the magistrates, we'll press it out of thee. They got them then a heavy beam and laid it on his breast. They loaded it with heavy stones and hard upon him pressed. More weight, now said this wretched man, more weight, again he cried. And he did no confession make, and wickedly he died. <laughs> I love doing it. And, I, and it just mentions that. And I can get away with it because it mentions the black world history. All right. All right, so what am I going to do about these black locust trees? They're just wrecking Fanny's garden. Who's going to come and save me? Fanny herself. There she is. Look at that, Fanny. Uh, this is a this is a uh, the this original painting of Fanny Allen was done in 1771. We don't, I don't believe we know who the artist is, and the original is in is at Fort Ticonderoga, and this is just a color copy mounted on some foam board that we have in uh, in Ethan Allen's living room. If anyone here is handy and wanted to make a rustic frame for Fanny's picture, for the, we would love that. But there she is. She was 11 years old at the time. And people say this is a John Singleton Copley painting, and it's not. Um, this 
is a John Singleton Coffin painting. You know who that is? That is Con Captain John Montresor, who was Fanny's father. She, and Fanny was illegitimate. Captain John Montresor of the British colonial forces, he was a military engineer, and he never recognized, he never recognized Fanny's existence. Uh, but he was painted by John Singleton Copley, and uh, Fanny was not. But they, this, uh, both these paintings happened in 1771. Uh, if you've ever go to Boston, Copley Square is named after John Singleton Copley. He was a he was a Tory, and uh, he went back to England when the revolution. Was. His father-in-law was one of the owners of the ships that they dumped the, all the tea off of. So he had, to, he had to go back to London when the revolution happened. John Singleton Copley. But I'm digressing. Fanny. Fanny Allen Penn. I admire her. You know. That Ethan Allen. This is the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And it's easy to underestimate Ethan Allen. He was a bit of a loud mouth drunken vulgar. But don't underestimate him. He was deep. But as much as I like Ethan Allen, Fanny's really my hero. And the reason Fanny's my hero is, late in her life she created this herbarium that they have at the University of Vermont. And uh, so I went to see the herbarium at the University of Vermont. Here's an example of one of the things she sees. It's a daisy. And, uh, and look at that. They didn't have scotch tape, right? And they, so how did she attach the stems to the paper? She cut little slits in the paper and put the specimens of the plants in, wove the, the stems through the slits, slits in the paper. All right. Fanny and Adelia collected 90 species of plants, 200 different specimens. And of course, there is some controversy. Did Fanny Allen Penniman, did she really make, make the, that herbarium that they have at the University of Vermont? Is it really hers? There's, it's not signed anywhere saying Fanny Allen Penniman did this. Uh, so I think there is some dispute about it. But, of course she did. So Fanny Ellen's herbarium is going to come to my rescue. Ooh, there's in the 20th century they made a typewritten list of uh, the different from the from the different specimens of what she had written on hand in hand, and uh, 60 different plants, and that is what you have here. That is what was the hand that we had. So I said, oh, Fanny's garden. Well, it's going to become a shade garden because we're never going to get rid of these black locust trees. So if it's going to be a shade garden, we're going to let's put in some perennials that like the shade. And that way we won't have to go through all this every year with the annuals, with the corn, breaking our heart over the corn. A strong wind comes down and knocks down all the corn and I want to kill myself. Let's forget that. Let's just put in perennials. You put in perennials, you plant them once, and if you do it right, they come back year after year. You don't have to do anything. Sometimes they spread, they come back too much. So let's go through Fanny's list of plants and see what kind of perennials are available today that we could put in Fanny's garden. So Fanny saved me from the black locust trees. And another thing, black locust trees are in the list of Fanny's herbarium. She took cuttings from that. That's one of the 60 plants is the black locust trees, because there are black locust trees growing here in Vermont. So we can cut down the black locust trees. I've got to stop hating on the black locust trees, because they're in Fanny's herbarium. Also, this past season, I live in Colchester. I got the spongy moth caterpillars. Terrible. They got inside my screened-in porch and the, the season before it and laid eggs. And all these caterpillars, all inside the screened-in porch, just, it was like horrible. It was gross. On those webby, spidery things, you just walk out back there. It was horrible. The, the black locust trees are resistant to the spongy moth caterpillars. You I come here to work, not a spongy moth caterpillar to be seen because they don't like the black locusts. So this is the year I said, all right, I made peace with the black locusts, but <laughs> Fanny liked them well enough to include them in her herbarium, and uh, the black locusts, the uh, spongy moths, don't like them. So, here are the plants. Here are some of the plants in Fanny's herbarium. And now, oh, I'm running a little behind schedule. I thought I wasn't going to have enough information. All right, there are there were plants when I saw that list in 2019 of plants in Fanny's herbarium. I realized a lot of the plants on that list were already growing there. Not even, not even that I had planted, they've been growing there forever. Like these, what are these? You, you know what these are. Lily of the Valley. Deadly poison, but smells really nice. I, I looked up Lily of the Valley on, on Wikipedia, and I found out Christian Dior was Christian Dior's favorite flower. And in the 1950s, he had some Lily of the Valley perfume in uh, It's the national flower of Yugoslavia and Finland, I also found out. 
And uh, it, it, has, it is used in folk medicine, but there's no scientific evidence of effective medicinal use. It is highly toxic. But uh, it smells so sweet. And we have a big patch of it that comes up. And what's that? Oh, that's phlox. P-H-L-O-X. Phlox, there are 67 species of phlox. And there's a perennial farm in Hardwick, Vermont, that sells, that, that, that is, they specialize in phlox. They have a lot of different species of phlox. Phlox can be a ground cover, or it can be, it can be a, a longer, taller plant, right? Like, and we've got phlox growing in Kenny's garden. Um, and let's see, what's that? Oh, these. These don't grow in Fanny's garden, but they grow in my front yard. And they are, uh, that was in, that was in Fanny for Barry. And they are bluettes, also known as Quaker ladies, which I, which I find very, which I find very amusing. Because of, uh, uh, and uh, they are little tiny things. And if you were to go to see them in Fanny's, in Fanny's herbarium in, at the University of Vermont, you'd think there would be specimens of bluettes left and go through this bit. Little tiny things, but uh, they grow up in my front yard, and they're so pretty that it looks like snow when frost on the ground. When they come up, and I and I don't cut, I don't have them mowed until uh, they're over. Oh, what is that? Oh, this was a finish for very the rhubarb. Oh, we love the rhubarb. Look at that. Look at it, it comes out of the ground. The rhubarb has been growing in the same spot in Fanny's garden since long before I, I, I was here. I probably planted in the 1980s. And look, when it comes up out of the ground, it comes up in April. April, early May, it looks like from outer space, doesn't it? And there's the red, delicious stalks of the rhubarb. Oh, we love the rhubarb. Look at that. Just want to eat that. You can dip it in sugar and eat it, or you can just eat down on it. That's just wrong. I like it really sour. I make, here's, here's my rhubarb. I make rhubarb uh, jam out of it. It's very easy. You just cut up the stalks, make a little water, a little sugar, and I don't use much sugar because I like it really sour. And some lemon peel. Chomp up some lemon peel. You use for the pectin because there's pectin and lemon peel to make, make it. Make it all hold together. So that's my rhubarb jam. I love the rhubarb. We don't have much rhubarb in Fanny's garden. Every year, don't I say, every year, I say in the spring, remind me, we're going to transplant, we're going to divide up the rhubarb and we're going to split it up. But you know what happens is, this year, I wanted to do that early in the spring, and then they didn't turn our hose on until May 15th. <sighs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> what is that? This is foxglove, also known as digitalis. Look at that. This has been growing in Fanny's garden forever. And, uh, you know, Dr. Penn, Fanny, Fanny after he now died, Fanny married a third husband, uh, Penn, Dr. Penn. And he, we always called him a doctor. He was a judge, though, right? He was also a judge and a lawyer. A little bit of everything. He was a little bit of everything. Anyway, he was a doctor, and he would have had, he would have had foxglove in his medicine bag. This is also known as digitalis. Adjust your pulse, adjust your heartbeat. Uh, but it is highly toxic. And the story is they were given uh, digitalis to Vincent Van Gogh, the artist. And one of the side effects of digitalis is it makes you hallucinate like you're seeing everything through a yellow filter. And they think that's why Vincent Van Gogh had a yellow period. There's a Vincent Van Gogh head from his yellow period. All right. And I was reading about this on Wikipedia, and Vincent Van Gogh said, I don't know. They don't know for a fact that they actually gave Vincent Van Gogh digitalis. And Vincent Van Gogh wrote in a letter at the time that, oh, I just like yellow. So that made this <laughs> not be true. You know, I, I was a professional tour guide for many years. So everything I say when I give a tour, and everything I say in this lecture today, you want to take it all with a grain of salt. <laughs> because I don't want to say I'm a liar, but let's say if it's a good story, if it's a good story, I'll, I'll, I'll use it even if I know it's not exactly you know, the truth. And of course, I make, I make up conversations all the time. The, con the conversation between Fanny, after Ethan was dead, between Fanny and Ira Allen about the 1,400, the 1400 acres in Burlington. You know, Ethan intended me to have the 1,400 acres in Burlington. Ira. No, Fanny, I'm sorry. Uh, the 1,400 acres belongs to the Onion River Land Company. And I'm the Onion River Land Company. I'm the last surviving partner. Uh, so the land is mine, 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 but you can stay here as long as you need to, dear, with the children. And she said, uh, well, that's not fair. I'm going to sue you, I really. Well, Fanny, you can't sue me because you're a single woman, and a single woman can't bring a case in court. And I should know. I wrote the Constitution of the Republic, so I know all the laws. And Fanny said, fine, I'll get married again. And she got married again. She hooked me. She went down to southern Vermont and hooked back Dr. Penn within two years, and Penn went sued her. 
and won. <laughs> Hooray for Fanny. <laughs> that out around, what a crook he was. I say that with love. That's true. Uh, uh, here we go. What is it? The sorrel. This is my this was my biggest success. Uh, of all the plants I put in in 2017, um, these are plants that, that were started into the plants that I put in. We put in the sorrel, and this is, um, they use this in French cooking. We don't use it here too much anymore. Uh, this is English or garden sorrel, and it's a salad green. It's a perennial green. It's the first thing that comes up. It comes up in April. Like April 4th, it'll start coming out of the ground if there's not snow in there. And uh, you just, you, the baby leaves are just really delicious. They taste like they taste like lemon. They've got a sour flavor like lemon. And you can just use it like a, a spinach. You, you cook it and make prima sorrel soup like that. And uh, the French cook fish in it a lot. It's highly acidic. It's got oxalic acid in it, so you can't eat too much of it because it'll make you sick. But uh, the acid in it, they cook, the French would cook it with fish. If the fish have little mild, uh, little thin bones, the, 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 the sorrel will dissolve the bones because there's so much acid in it. It's what I read on Wikipedia last night, I don't know. <laughs> so sorrel. But sorrel, as we go in the garden, and we eat, that's when, we, when you take the tour of the homestead, you always got to eat some of the sorrel. And you have to cut it back. It loves being where it is. It must like the nitrogen because it's right under a black, uh, a black locust tree. And uh, it gets really big and it gets the flowers. You have to take the flowers off to send the energy back into the leaves for the, for the, for the flavor. But when it gets hot, we just cut it down and give it, we give it a dramatic crew cut. Uh, a couple of times a year, and that encourages the new, the new shoots to come up because they're so delicious. All right, sorrel, I love that, and that was in Fanny's Ramirez. And what's that? Oh, the elderberry. Look at that. That is 2017. We just put, we put an elderberry bush in. Fanny had elder had elderberries on her, uh, on her. There's some elderberries. Now look at the next one. Those are the elderberry blossoms. Look at that. How pretty. And then what is that? These are the elderberries themselves. The fr I, got, I got elderberries the first couple of seasons, uh, and I made jelly. I made elderberries, and elderberries are slightly toxic, so you have to juice them. You have to maybe squish them and make juice, and then cook the juice for 20 minutes at least. They've got their slight, they contain some trace amounts of cyanide in the elderberries, so you have to cook them anyway. And you make elderberry jelly. Look at that on a Ritz cracker. That's delicious. <laughs> the elderberry jelly didn't turn out as well as as, as well as the rhubarb can, I don't know. But uh, we, got, we got elderberries for, let me see, how many seasons? Three seasons. The last few, the last few seasons, the birds just eat the elderberries. We put net around the elderberries to keep the birds away, and that didn't work at all. The birds just eat the elderberries. We don't get elderberries. I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, all right. On Fanny's list of plants were beans. So, I mean, just ordinary beans. These are the scarlet runner beans we grow every year. They're, the, they're called scarlet runner beans because the, the flowers are scarlet. And those are the beans there. Okay. What's that? That's chamomile. And in 2017, we planted some chamomile seeds. A little tiny seed. Just threw it in the ground. It comes up. Make tea out of that. And that was in the... That was in Fanny's. That was in Fanny's. Herbarium. All right. What is that? Oh, that's sage. You make the Thanksgiving stuffing out of that. And of course, we, we have some that we, we draw. I mean, I always, t I always tell the sucker, to, uh, the, the, uh, the visitors, that uh, we, we, we draw, we make a smudge stick out of the sage and, uh, and burn it in it. In Ethan Allen's house, to cleanse the house of evil spirit. We never do. <laughs> my, my luck, I burn the house down. All right. What is that? That is red clover. What, why, why do we love red clover in Vermont? It's the, it's the state flower of Vermont. Right. And that grows, that grows in Canyon Square, and I threw some red clover seed. And sometimes it comes up, sometimes it doesn't, you never know. Okay. Oh, now these are things I put in in 2022, which was this year, was the year I said, okay, we're going to add some plants, we're going to add some perennials to Fanny's garden, to uh, that, that were in Fanny's list of plants. And so we're going to talk about four or five plants that I've added this year to Fanny's garden. This is the barren strawberry. And it is a uh, it is a ground cover, and it's really sort of a pointless plant. It makes strawberries like a regular strawberry, but you can't you know, they're dry. It's called dry or barren strawberries. They don't taste like anything. But it was in Fanny's herbarium, and they had it at horse fruits nursery. So I said, "We'll put some of that." They said, "Oh, it spreads like crazy, and sends out those you know those things that go all over the garden. It spreads like crazy. Don't put that." In. I said, "Oh, I, I wanted to do that. <laughs> I wanted to spread like crazy." 
Oh, what is this? Oh, this is the flowering raspberry man. The flowering, talk about strawberries you can't eat. Well, flowering raspberries are raspberries you can't eat either. And that was in Fanny's list of herbarium, and they had it, they had them at uh, they had them in Horsford. So I got one and said, oh, that's not enough punishment. Let's get three of them. So we got two more, and I only have three of them. And do you think they look it looks like that? No. It doesn't. Look at look at look at the end of the season is so oh, beautiful plant. Good. You look as quickly well, and you can't even you can't even eat the raspberry. It's and it's good for nothing. I mean they don't use it medicinally for anything. It's just a, it's just an ornamental shrub. And th this year it didn't even make, it made one flower. Three plants made one flower. And so our garden volunteer, Dave, uh, who knows more about gardening, so much more than I do, said, well, you know, your raspberries, they do that. The first couple of years, you don't get any raspberries. So, so don't, pull the, don't pull the flowering raspberry up yet. Although I'd love to pull it up, because it's so hideous. And it just spread like crazy. You know, it was in a pot this big, and you plant it there, and it's just like huge. Oh, man. And then no flowers. And at least it doesn't have sponger thorns, like most raspberries have thorns on them. And this one doesn't. All right. What is this? Oh, this is the spiderwort. The pomegranate spiderwort. This is how stupid I am. All right. So I, so I go to Horsford's garden and nursery, and it's, you know, it's in April, and nothing's coming up yet much in the garden. It's mostly dirt. So I said, well, here are plants that are on Fanny's list of herbarium. Let's see what they have at Horsford's garden and nursery. Spiderwort. Well, that's on the list, so let's get some of this. So we got five spiderworts, and we planted them in Danny's garden. And then I, you know, I'm bending over planting them. I turn around, and I look in the jungle, and all this spiderwort is coming. The whole, the, like, like acres and acres of spiderwort. And this is, a, this is not the stuff I bought and planted. Uh, this is the stuff that comes up in the, that comes up in the jungle. And what is spiderwort? Spiderwort, it is native to the Americas from Canada to Argentina. And uh, the natural range of the genus is the entire length and width of North America. That's all I have. It's, it's got 85, it's a gen, genus with 85 species. All right. So that is spiderwort. Right. Oh, this is the one. This is Solomon's Hill. You all have this growing in, your, in the spring. This all, it looks sort of like a lily of the valley. Uh, as, uh, and it's called Solomon's Hill. And this is the same deal. I got five of these at the uh, at Horsford's Garden gar, uh, Nursery. And we planted them, and then we look out in front of the, the uh, park district office. There's like a jungle of it. It comes up. And then I go home, and there's like a jungle of it on the side of my house. And I said, oh, no. Oh, there's, there's, more, there's more money. The Solomon Seal. All right. Polygonatum. Polygonatum by Flora is the scientific name. And there are 63 species of it, uh, mostly in Asia. And uh, it is used in herbal medicine. You make a salve or tonic out of it. It's supposed to be good for joints and ligaments and tendons. If you have osteoarthritis, the starchy roots contain sugars, which which feed healthy bacteria in your intestines. Uh, and the starchy roots were used like potatoes, and they made flour out of the out of the roots. Uh, in Europe, they would use it. They would only eat it when they were starving. And the green shoots coming up out of the ground taste like asparagus. So when they when they come up, let's pull it, let's pull some out of the ground. And we'll eat it and make, make, see if it tastes like asparagus. And then all right. Oh dear, my time's almost up. This is our last plant, and this is the Camelotifolia or the mountain laurel. I'm from New Jersey, uh, and these things grew up everywhere in New Jersey. It's the state flower of Connecticut and Pennsylvania. And they grew everywhere. I live in a town in New Jersey called Mount Laurel. And it was in southern New Jersey, so it was flat. But it had a hill about this high, covered in, in Mount Laurel. The Tommy Lanifold. You don't see it in here much in Vermont. I think it's a little too cold in Vermont. But it was on Fanny's list of plants. So I found a couple of those at Gardener Supply. And I planted one in the middle of Fanny's garden. And uh, it went into shock, and the leaves turned yellow and got brown spots on them, and it's not really happening. Uh, uh, and uh, I planted one in my house, and pretty much the same story. But, but we'll see. We'll see if it, serves, if it comes back over the winter. So, all right. Well, I didn't have any. I thought I was going to be done in 20 minutes and, and be really embarrassed because I run out of material. But, gee, I've got 55 minutes. I'm sorry I kept you here for so long. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions you
What do you got cooking for next year on the garden? Next year? Mm. I don't know. Anything new? Dylan and Shannon, you know, they haven't agreed to it yet. It was all my decision and they haven't said anything about it. I'm, I'm sick of it. You know, this spring, I would wake up in the morning and think about, oh, are they going to turn on my hose? Oh, i got to plant the irises. Oh, bro, bro, bro. I can't have this. You know, I'm still doing this as a volunteer. I'm not going to pay for this. I'm going to hand over management of the garden to Dylan and Jen. Dylan and Jen haven't said a thing. They just look at me like this. <laughs> but they're, they're going to they're gonna take it over. Next year, I think we want to plant the, the flax in the full sun because we've been making we've been making new beds in the full sun because you can't get full sun in January. So we're going to grow the flax in the full sun. That's the main thing I want to do. So we can get real tall flax like we've never had since. Yes? How much textile have you made from the flax? The flax. Every year, we grow 100 square feet of flax. Okay. And if this were the 18th century, you would grow a quarter acre of flax. That's 100 square feet times 108. So that's when I say farming, gardening in the, in the 21st century is nothing like it was in the 18th century. There's, there's an example. Okay. A hundred square feet of flax makes uh, makes probably enough linen fabric to make half a man's handkerchief. <laughs> it's just a guess. That's a guess. We do, we don't get as far as making the fabric. We get we only get as far as um, uh, spinning spinning the fiber and making thread. And if we had a big fancy one, we could make we could make that. But not much is my would be the answer. Of course, flaxseed now is very valued. In the 18th century, do you know if it had value for nutrition or anything? Flaxseed. The flaxseed that you buy in the supermarket, because it's a trendy additive to things, is the same plant, it's a different variety, and it's the flaxseed that they take, that they, the flaxseed you make linen out of is one stem, mostly. Uh, but the flaxseed, uh, each plant of, that, they, that they're gonna use for foods, has a lot more branches, so you have a lot more seeds per plant. But other than that, I don't know if they use the flax seed for, for uh, to, to do anything. They make linen out of it and linseed oil and flaxseed oil. Oh, out of the same kind of Yeah, because oh, okay. linseed oil, linen, linen, line fiber is the long, smooth fiber inside the plant, and that's where the word linen comes from and linseed oil. Oh, yes. Uh, is there any evidence as to what what uh, any of the garden looked like here? What, oh, what, how big it was, or how big it was? No, there's what I say. Or, or journals? <laughs> no, there's nothing. There's uh, there's what I say and what I what I guesstimate. And I say, you know, when I'm giving the tour of the garden, what does Fanny grow in her garden? Well, first of all, Fanny had a servant named Eliza who probably did all the work. And uh, so, uh, uh, but what would she have grown in her garden? We don't know. But food. We assume she would have grown food because there were ten people living in the house during the long cold winter and they ate mostly game, so it was nice to have some kind of vegetables or fruit or vegetables put up for, for variety in their diet. So we assume she would have grown strictly food for the consumption of the people in the house and it would have been a lot bigger. It would have been a lot bigger than, than that little garden. It would have covered the whole a whole net because you need ten people you need a lot of food. And then later, she married Penniman and moved back into this, moved back into this house while she was still in Ireland, and uh, would have had an additional garden, and that would have been separate from the food garden, uh, and it would have been more more perennials. And what she what she grew, and she wouldn't have grown corn because Ethan grew corn meat and hay. Uh, that was his; those, those were his main crops. So I doubt she would have grown corn in her in the garden. But you're. In answer to your question, we have no idea. No, no clue. All right. Uh, just one thing. You mentioned the Pringle Herbarium at the University of Vermont. Yes. I don't think they do guided tours officially there, but if you call them, uh, you went. Yeah. The, and, and I, forget, I forget the guy's name. Went up there a few years ago. They were very accommodating, very hospitable. Yeah. And they have. 
Fanny and one of her daughters pressed flowers, a great collection. But they also, it's a depository for seeds from all over the world, all over the world. They're one of several sites all over the world that, where they, they, they preserve these seeds in case there's some kind of a major holocaust. They would have seeds that they could regenerate some of these uh, species. So it's a very, very professional, very great uh, place to visit. And the people there were very accommodating when we went up. So. Well, there's a booklet out there about Fanny's garden. Yeah. It's very good-looking pictures, pictures. pictures of the cards, because one day the cards were here this summer when you were filming that documentary. Well, they were. Yeah, they were. Oh. And they were beautiful. Yeah. They are. They they're, they're, they're really good. That there, that booklet, in addition to having some biography of Fanny. I would love to know if, it, if Fanny really named them. Because we didn't. We don't know. The, oh, no. the dispute is Fanny wrote the scientific name for the different plants on on all the papers, and people are skeptical that she would have been able to find that information because it was only in a few books that were published in Europe that she would find the scientific name for the different species that were written on the paper. But Fanny was an avid reader, and she, we know she ordered books from Europe, from England. Uh, all the time, so I don't think that's a I don't think that's a valid I don't think that's a valid argument that she didn't have the access to the book. All right. But I also heard that she well was quite well educated for when she was a yeah. teen yeah. Yeah. and studied. Yeah. yeah. Tom, will you be sticking around to answer any other questions? Oh there? sure, I have nothing to do. I know where to go. <laughs> so please uh, give a, one more round of applause for your comments.
to do some um, maybe holiday shopping in our <laughs> gift shop, <laughs> help us clear out our inventory from 2022, um, and another big thank you to Tom for presenting. Today.